the content director here at Argo Design. And in case you don't already know, we are a product design firm. Uh, we design hardware and software, um, but our specialty is um, designing technologies that humans want to use and that benefit humanity. And so in that spirit, we are thrilled to have a couple of different, uh, very unique innovations here tonight in the Argo studio. You have probably already met the first one, uh, which is Apollo uh, back in the northeast corner of our studio. Uh, that's a robot designed by, uh, that we designed um, with uh, Aptronic, who is based here in Austin. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to meet Apollo, I encourage you after this to go have your uh, picture taken with him. Uh, the other innovation is the reason I'm sitting up here tonight. Um, and it is a incredibly unique and forward thinking storytelling platform that we are going to delve into tonight. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, we, we have, oh, this, I didn't coordinate this. We have Roni Amovitz here, who is the founder and CEO of Sun and Thunder and Synth B, and he is a senior advisor for Boston Consulting. He is also the founder of the spatial computing company Magic Leap, which you may have heard of, and Mako Surgical, which is a world leader in haptic robotics for orthopedic surgery. And then we have with us Sir Richard Taylor, <laughs> wearing quite a fetching cowboy hat. <laughs> Uh, Richard is the co-founder of Weta Workshop, which you may have heard of, uh, which has provided design and physical effects for more than 120 films and television shows, including the Lord of the Rings trilogy, hey. Avatar, and Black Panther. Uh, he is the winner of five Academy Awards for special effects makeup, visual effects, and costume design. Um, and he's a knight, which is so freaking cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, Hence the hat. I yes. Just, I just got to say, I grew up on a cattle farm. My mum and dad bred limmers and beef cattle. I uh, rounded the cattle on the back of a horse every day of my life till I left home. And this is the first time I've ever worn a cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and it went in Rome. So, yeah. Exactly. So we're going to start uh, by previewing a trailer for Our Blue, and then after we watch that, I'm going to ask Roni what in the heck we just watched. So let's go for it. Okay. So, what did we just watch? <laughs> I think I was abducted this morning. We were in Roswell, New Mexico, for real. Um, the, the short, long story, I'll do it pretty quickly. Um, I was actually building robots, 
for surgery, and I reached out to Weta. I think it was 2008 or 2009. They were in the middle of doing the film Avatar. It hadn't been launched yet, so it was sort of like then. And I got back a message from the Weta team which said a friend of robots is a friend of Weta. And then Richard invited me down to, to Wellington, New Zealand, and we started to collaborate on a world we called Our Blue. Uh, and, and the idea of the Our Blue is like, it's almost now, um, you have the magic hour, like in the evening, uh, the golden hour, and then after that, you have what's called the blue hour, they were blue in French. Um, and it has all sorts of weird mystical implications across all sorts of cultures and religions, like the earth and sky dissolve together. It's also known as a portal to different worlds. Um, and it's kind of the, the beginning of, of something different and you're entering night. I thought it was a good metaphor for what we're all about to go through. Uh, this sort of convergence of like, you know, it's at a singularity, something really weird is going on. So back in 2008, 2009, I was talking to Richard about what happens after movies. What are those things? And how do you experience that? What's this cinematic reality? We took a decade-long detour and built a company called Magic Leap, which was pushing the envelope on immersive computing. Won't get into that right now. And then after that, I started... Um, a new company called Sun and Thunder, and a sister company called Synthpy, which was, how do you build a story world in this day and age? Um, how do you tell those stories in something that goes beyond film? What's the technology behind it? And how do you leverage AIs and people to do something that's impossible for human beings to do alone? So is what we just watched where those were varying scenes, those were uh, different aspects of the story world that you can build from? Is that a fair assumption that was like a very quick teaser of um art and themes and ideas that we've been working on okay. with the team from weta uh, okay it doesn't really tell you the story at all but it gives you a tiny um sense of the mood of what's going to happen i could mention something so when Rodi approached us all those years ago uh we knew immediately that unlike most filmmakers that come and work with us or that we have the great blessing of working with them where they're telling a singular thread of a story and that's going to be captured within a one and a half to three hour movie, this person that turned up on our doorstep actually was desiring to build a whole mythopia, a, a, a mythological world into which you could tell any story. It's exactly what James Cameron is doing. In the first film of Avatar, we happen to have come upon the tree-dwelling Na'vi and uh, in the second film, we come upon the people that exist, the Navi people that exist in the water tribes. But uh, the reality that we're starting to build in their heads is that Jim could drop you into any part of uh, Pandora and you would experience a completely plausible ecology equivalent to the first two ecologies that you've already met. And, and it, because, of course, he's building a mythopia, not a film. And that's indeed what Roni was aspiring to do. And that's exactly what we as a group of creatives love to do because uh, building those plausible ecologies that you, uh, that you see in something like Lord of the Rings where Tolkien uh, didn't perceive of a story of a group of hobbits that go on a journey to Mount Doom he perceived of a whole universe, a whole world that you could drop any story into. And we just happened to have joined the Hobbits. And uh, that was an incredibly inspiring moment to meet Roni, talk about our blue, and begin what has now been a 12-year journey to bring his world to life in uh, multiple aspects. And to go on a, I was a founding board member for Roni on Magic Leap and to go on this eight and a half year diversion into this insane piece of extraordinary technology uh, that yet is really going to have its moment in the sun. We got to do the very first game on on mixed reality in the form of um, Dr. Grawport's Invaders. But, uh, but coming full circle after all those years back to our blue, and getting the chance to make the first short film with Roni through our children's television production company, and then be here today sharing uh, Romy's vision with you is very, very exciting. 
So what what can you do in a story world that you can't do outside of one? That's a great question. So um, there's a, I don't know if we have the Kyoto. Do you have the Kyoto slide up here? Two. Let's go to that. that did, uh, oh, yes, it's right there. So there was an inspiration right before the pandemic uh, going to Kyoto in Japan. And if you experience Kyoto, it's like being in a Miyazaki film, but in a story world of that. Like anywhere you go uh, in any corridor, there's just something going on. You can walk into a restaurant and there's like a thousand year history. You could talk to any person on the street and everywhere you go, it's like infinite dimension of story, not just inst infinite dimension of like detail and culture and myth, but anyone you talk to, there's a story path that leads in all dimensions. So uh, we came up with this idea of the Kyoto test, which is like in a story world we build, can you become lost for like three days and not know it? That's a high bar to achieve. Uh, but I do think we're going to get there maybe in the next, maybe next decade. We'll see. I think we're actually getting pretty close. Um, but I think what you could do in a story world different from a movie, think about a movie as like a slice of Japanese history, right? Watch a Kurosawa movie. But Japan itself, thousands of years, it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's growth. And the tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people who lived and died and, and continued to live in Japan, that whole thing, all the stories, all the myths, all the food, all the culture, all the art, that container is the Japan story world. So if you try to build a story world with the way we make movies, you'd need tens of millions of people in like a thousand years. But we're on the verge, particularly with some of the stuff we're doing, new forms of AI. So a creative team powered by that could actually achieve a story world, I think for the first time. And I think that becomes really interesting. Not just pieces of it, but the whole of it. I think thinking of a story world as a vestibule into which you can place philosophy, art, and music. And in that, uh, in that container is then the ability to mix any recipe of those three things to evolve any, any, an infinite number of story worlds and, uh, and elevate people's ability to exist within a particular story world that they have architected themselves. The film originally was an appointment viewing experience where you had to go to the cinema with hundreds of people in a communal setting, and then um, streaming became at your choice of uh, of schedule, but it is still a piece of art that you're being shown and told. And then we get something like Fortnite, where you can roam freely, but the content still is what the creator chose to create. This is the next evolution of that, where we see the ability to evolve our own choice of content in our own time, in our own worlds, infinitely. Wow. Uh, I didn't say this truly mind boggling. Yeah, I know. Dude. Oh, um, okay. Well, so let's. South by Southwest. Exactly, so. dude. And we are in Calvary. This is Jared's fault, co founder of Argo. It's totally so. Jared's fault. We're going to wear it the entire South by. There he is. There he is. Um, I want to, before we watch the film, which, okay, I have a couple questions. So, first off, um, Let's talk about generative AI because this would, if I understand correctly, this would not be possible without generative AI. Talk to us about that. I think generative AI represents something that's coming from underneath what we think of as generative AI, which is this like, think of the, the fuel, like, you know, Texas, it's got oil under the ground, right? So the oil in the ground is like what's happening at the silicon level, at the GPU level, uh, at chips that have like, you know, hundreds of thousands of like crazy processors coming together in parallel. Uh, I just spoke with the CEO of a, an amazing company called, uh, I'm not going to name them, but just doing something that's even more nuts than NVIDIA. So that energy is enabling systems like Gen AI and like, and that will turn into other names as well. Um, but it basically shows like what used to take 10 years and a thousand people to make a film. I mean, we're going to enter the days where it's like two people in their garage are gonna make a Marvel movie, uh, you know, powered by AI. And the question is like, how do you harness that thing so that you can maintain creative control? How do you use this new computing energy to do things that are not just replacing what people do, but doing things we cannot do without it? So it's like, I think that's much more interesting to expand the creative universe than to go and wreck the current one. It's imperative though, and they, 
efforts to make sure that the the uh, I guess the tail doesn't start wagging the dog, right? That's what AI is running the risk of, and it's starting to happen, and could happen very significantly, and uh, and we become the apes, and the AI becomes the human. But Roly's uh, aspiration with the colleagues, some of them in the room today, is to make sure that we, as the dog, always remain wagging the tail, and uh, let's hope for that. Yeah, and, and just one thing on that, we... Are you right how I put that? Yes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very... So in order to kind of make sure that happens, we don't want to leave it the chance. So basically created a creative company and a sibling uh, called Synthpy, whose purpose is to take that underlying computational energy, but to use it to completely empower creative people uh, and innovative people in a way that they maintain utter control. Uh, and I think there's going to be an interesting um, yin-yang between other philosophies of AI, which you'll probably already have lost control that consume like a, like the little shop of horrors plant, everything around them. And this other thing we're building. So hopefully this other thing we're building is a other way forward that might be more friendly to artists and creatives. So what we're about to watch is a nine and a half minute film, a short film, which is uh, a, a, an evidence of everything that we're talking about. Is that a fair way to um, that's probably over. It's it's a <laughs> okay. It's it's a it's a short film. It's the first short film we made of a slice of the hour blue world. And in fact, it's a tiny piece. It's inside a bunker, uh, so okay. the world outside's implied. Okay. Uh, there is a character who shows up who's really important to the whole film that you'll see. I don't want to ruin it. Um, and there are things in there that were created with AI, and there were things in there created by people. Uh, and they're blended together. Okay. I won't say what. Okay, good. Yeah. Can I, can I just suggest yes. some of you in the room, like myself, are service providers, servicing creatives, uh, such creative clients such as Romy, uh, pause for a moment and consider how you extrapolate the type of brief that you get <laughs> that results in what you're about to see. <laughs> and, uh, and then maybe buy me a beer later. <laughs> so, Two beers for a chick. <laughs> okay, well, but, yeah, let's watch this.
Okay, so yeah. that was trippy. But <laughs> Keep Austin weird. <laughs> we can it. So my immediate question while I was watching that is how much of that was generated by AI? <laughs> yep. Wait. We, we could ask. Let me answer it this way. Okay. Um, more human than AI, but okay. little little sprinkles of AI. If it was an ice cream sundae, there's like a cherry, some some chocolate sprinkles. Okay. And each one we do, it's increasing it. And we wanna make sure that it's completely never obvious what happens. Why do you wanna make that obvious? Or it's that, why when it's not be obvious? Because when we don't want the seamless. AI to be the story. Mm. Uh, the, the creative team should always be in the spotlight. Uh, and, and AI is sort of like the minions around them helping, uh, but not really taking the center stage. So you talked earlier about the creative brief <laughs> and how you executed on that. Do you want us to tell, tell us a little bit about how exactly you tackled uh, something so wildly imaginative and unique? Well, firstly, I'll mention we're, we're a practical effects company. I, my primary soapbox is about uh, speaking to young people about the necessity to keep tactility and the love of making and creating in one's life. So it seems an odd uh, 
fusion of that aspiration and Romy's will for us to find ourselves on this uh, 10 year journey uh, towards a world where AI can be the primary creative uh, or primary technical power. But I, I also run a company where we've tried to always offer a new generation of kids that come to us the, uh, the possibilities of wielding their craft in a unique and uh, imaginative way. And we, are, we all have to acknowledge and accept that a AI future is part of our creative, some part of our creative um, journey. Uh, we can choose, obviously, we, we work very heavily in location-based experiences, an area that arguably AI can, can have little impact on if we choose to keep it very physical and very tactile, where the screen industry will see a shift at some level. So uh, it, is, um, it is a very fine balance. It's a conundrum uh, at some level for us, but... Uh, we have to be open-minded. We can't be ostriches and uh, bear, burying our heads. Uh, obviously, this is a fairly abstract and intangible concept, but to be able to realize it is to understand the full universe of our blue, the singularity, the, uh, the astral planing across the universe through the orchard that Tommy Twee accesses, the fact that her brother Ezekiel Blue is a guerrilla warfare soldier fighting the Morvekian kings. These are all foreign words at the moment, but if Romy is successful, they will become commonplace as uh, uh, Han Solo and, uh, and uh, Princess Leia because uh, these are elements within a massive mythopia that this is a tiny slice of. And uh, like all of us that are trying to realize a director's vision, it's a firmly about getting under the very skin of the whole world to be able to realize the little nugget of an idea that might be birthed in the piece of uh, media that you initially are asked to do. So I would imagine some of you have some questions you'd like to ask. Yes, yeah, right here. Yeah. So there is a there from either... Uh, curious to hear from any of you or all of you about um, any excitement you ha might have or interest you might have or concerns you might have around technologies like OpenAI's Sora, uh, which is, you know, kind of jumping ahead, you know, three every three months it seems like we're jumping ahead. So curious to hear any thoughts on that. I think we're going to talk a little bit about that at our at our talk on Monday with, with Jared and company. but. I'll go first, Richard, and if you want to, I'm going to jump in. Um, I think one, I think a lot of us. I was about oh, to what's say. Oh, what story? Okay, so yeah. OpenAI, you've probably heard of, um, owned 49% by Microsoft, um, doing amazing things with AI, but I would call it the, the HAL 2001 version of AI. Um, and it's also sucked up almost the entire internet and all sorts of things that I would just argue don't belong to any of them. Um, so if you think about Sora as something living on top of OpenAI, what it's outputting is a synthesis of the creative work of all kinds of people uh, on the planet, and it's not the creative work of that group. So I think the biggest problem I have is what's in it, and what's in it is everything everyone's handed over for the last 20 years to these companies, and now the, the next step is thank you for your data and thank you for your content, we're just gonna use that to do all these other things, probably without your permission. So I think if you had your permission, all of a sudden the thing would be an empty shell uh, and they'd be starting over. So I think that's my biggest problem that like, I don't think any of you gave, if you, if you gave permission, put up your hand. So I don't, I don't know if anyone did. So that's, that's my biggest issue with it. Not that the AI isn't going to be amazingly powerful, but it feels like we're in the Napster phase where, hey, music's free, except for all the musicians that wrote all those songs and it's not free anymore. Uh, in the sense, unless you want to make it free as the artist. So copyrights, trademarks, your creative ownership, I think that all should play a role. doesn't seem to play a role right now. Yeah, last week, I uh, flew to Dubai uh, just for 24 hours. It's a long way from New Zealand uh, to, to be one of the judges on the uh, first ever short film AI competition. 
uh, 54 films ranging from three minutes to 20 minutes long that I'd prejudged down in New Zealand over a month ago. And when I popped up on stage, uh, one of the things that I mentioned is that the uh, the films that we had judged were now similar to uh, silent black and white movies, such as the technology had moved forward, as you're acknowledging, since we even judged them a month earlier. It's mind-boggling at the speed that things are now changing and, and uh, the speed at which we are moving forward. I have put my faith in the fact that Roni and his team at, at, at the... Um, at the the endeavor is trying to keep creativity firmly in the hands of the creative and keep creativity human made creativity at the heart of uh, the endeavor and uh, thus far that remains the uh, the intent and hopefully that can be a foil uh, to what we're seeing in other parts of the AI community any other yes. Hi, thanks you all for sharing this film and this new direction. Uh, I'm curious to talk a little bit about how you see this differentiated from or building upon open world game games that exist. And is there a difference between a first person game experience versus the types of uh, stories that you're trying to build in these worlds? Because it feels like this kind of path into an experience that could be done in either way. That's a great question, and um, games are great. Uh, and this may, just to draw a little bit of a line, like what's a story world, what's a game? Uh, it's our, actually our topic for the official talk on Monday, but um, I think of a story world as the container that should inherit like books, poetry, music, art, film, and there's no game loop. You don't have to play a game. Like if you go to Rome, there's not a game. If you go to Japan and just wander around and then go to a cool place and then meet someone and have a conversation, there's no game loop there, it just is. A book isn't a game, it simply is, and it's transmitting ideas and creativity. And I think of story, like Japan itself, let's use that in metaphor, the whole of Japan for the last thousands of years is you know, what I think of as a true story world, and again, it's not a game loop. So I feel like games, uh, and a friend of mine wrote Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson, so uh, game worlds are dominating the thinking. Right, so it's going to be an oasis from Ready Player One. It's going to be a metaverse like in Snow Crash. But the reason we're talking about story worlds at South by is that there's another path, which could be non-game loop, not gaming world. And games have their amazing benefits, and I see them branching. And sometimes there'll be things that blend both. But I think like a good movie, a great book, a great album, is really not a game at all. And I think a story world owes a lot more to that than it does to the game mechanics of something like Fortnite uh, or kind of what the Oasis or other things really kind of pushed into, which is gaming is the only way forward. It's a great way forward, but we want this to coexist and be another alternative. And it's almost not talked about at all. It's interesting too. I, I see one of the challenges that Roni faces is uh, communal viewing, right? Because you think about it, uh, the great, this fantastical thing's being invented 50, 60 years ago called a computer and it's going to create a social network amongst us all. And then a piece of technology such as VR is invented and it puts our children in shoe boxes and isolates them from that communal environment. And uh, how wonderful and beautiful it is, the conversations around the water coolers of the world that we all chat about the latest episode of the latest television series that we're all watching universally together. It's a great uniter when we have this chance. And does the story world concept begin to isolate people yet again because they are architecting and constructing their own uh, 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 narrative journeys into these amazing story worlds and they're not becoming part of the family or the community or your educational institution, etc. So I think a challenge that we have ahead of us through some is making sure that a component and possibly a very significant component of the story world that we invent a world that we can then share on with others uh, so that we remain in a communal experience as human beings. There's a, there a question way up back there. 
Okay, art historian in the house. Um, I just, first of all, thank you so much for this beautiful salon where a lot of very smart things are being said. But aesthetically, I'm really wondering why, like, surrealism seems to be aesthetically the zeitgeist of a lot of, of everything, actually. I was wondering if other art movements are waiting in the wings with the singularity, the wave of the singularity coming. Thank you. I'll take, a, I'll take a first shot, and then Richard should, should finish. That's a great question, by the way. Um, you could blame me for one part, and then Richard could finish it off, because he's an art historian genius. Um, my mom's an impressionistic painter, so she's probably screaming at me. But outside my office at Magic Leap, we had an original Dolly print. Um, and that Dolly print is of a brain wearing glasses, um, and it was the first augmented reality concept. Uh, he did it in 1975. I think it's like man wearing glasses looking at ants. And it's kind of an amazing drawing from 75. Um, I always thought that this whole field of like immersive reality um, and where things were going was just super surreal. I thought like Dolly was channeling it, but it's completely not limited to that. Um, we definitely rotated heavily on that at Magic Leap. Um, but Richard, why don't you finish it up because you know well, way more about art. Yeah, I think it comes down to computational fidelity at the end of the day. It doesn't in the case of Roni, right? That what you've just seen only has a tiny sprinkling of AI in it. That's primarily old school animation, storyboarding, doing the like how producing uh, a narrative and then animating to it. It's just that Roni looks through technicolored spectacles in a surrealist manner. And uh, uh, that's the journey I've been on with him. Just sit with him, as some of you have, friends in the room that share a lunch with him and you'll look through a Dali-esque um, vision as he relates the future world that he imagined. But it's interesting, isn't it, that AI, the, the, most, the, the, the most prevalent iterations of AI as seen in imagery have only been showing a surrealist world and uh, the smudging of the edges, um, what dreams may come by Vincent Ward might have been a filmic version of it very early. And I think that's computational fidelity. There's much smarter people in the room that could um, shoot that down or acknowledge that. But I think that's at what's at the heart of it is that the credibility of the technology has not yet allowed us to do a, a piece of Rococo art or uh, something that a, uh, another artist may have done through history. Do you think that's a fair comment relative to I think that's great. Yeah. Um, one last thing I want to say, just want to thank uh, Mark, Jared, the entire Argo team for allowing us to be here and, and do weird stuff to your brain. Um, Argo's great. We're going to work with them again. We'll work with them uh, magically. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, everyone enjoy a drink and some nosh and... Uh the rest of the night.